this new learning series on COVID-19 vaccination with a focus today on national deployment and vaccination planning and implementation. And I'm just gonna share a few logistic slides, go over uh, a few items to, to get us oriented. Great, so as I mentioned, today's session is gonna focus on national deployment and vaccination planning and implementation. This is a learning series building on the WHO COVID-19 vaccine open WHO training series. There are two series, one focused on national deployment and planning. The second is going to focus on vaccination training for health workers, and that will launch next week at the same time. We do have interpretation today for French and for Spanish. And if you go down to the Zoom toolbar at the bottom right of your screen, you'll see a little globe. If you click on that, you'll be able to select the language uh, interpretation of your choice. We really appreciate and look forward to your questions and comments. There's a Q&A function just next to that interpretation uh, icon. So please put your questions and comments there. Uh, we know there are a lot of people, there are already over 400 people signed in today. We may not be able to answer all the questions today, but we hope to get to them uh, and, and address as many today and in the next session. Also, there is a chat feature. If you've got any IT or logistic issues, uh, please put those there. We'll be monitoring that. Today's session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. We will be offering a certificate of attendance, which will be available through the University of New Mexico where Project ECHO is based. We'll be putting a link in the chat about 10 or 15 minutes before the end of the session. Just a note about data use. Uh, we take data stewardship and uh, very seriously and want to ensure everyone that when you register, when you answer the polling questions, all that data is kept confidential and kept uh, very carefully. With that, it's my pleasure to hand the microphone over to Ann Mullen with the WHO for our formal introduction and welcome, Ann. Thanks very much, Bruce. Um, indeed, we're very excited about this unique collaboration uh, with the ACT-A and the Project ECHO and, and other partners, TechNet and, and COVID Equity Project and Boost. Um, and as you said, every other week we'll have alternating sessions. Um, today is focusing on national and subnational focal points. Next week, health workers. But of course, everyone's you know able to join all the sessions, and we really look forward to bringing um, information and, and resources to the to the wide vast number of people. I heard that over 2,000 people are registered from over 150 countries. So this is indeed a wonderful. So um, before we get started, we're going to launch a poll to get a sense of the roles of the people online and your familiarity with the resources that we're going to be talking about, um, just to take a pulse on that. And then, so if you could launch the poll for everybody online and, and then um, also go to the next slide, I'll introduce our two speakers for today and our topics. So we have um, two really important topics for today. So the goal of all of these is to um, provide an outline to the countries on what, what's needed on the access to COVID-19 vaccines available through the COVAX facility, and really to, to focus in for today on two things. One is really to highlight the WHO resources that are available to, to every country um, on the on the WHO website for submission and reviewing and developing your national deployment and vaccination plan. And this is a stage many, many countries are in now. And so speaking on this topic today, we're gonna to have Diana Chong Blanc. She's the manager of immunization program operations, but she's also the lead for the vaccine introduction working group on our country readiness and delivery team here at WHO. Um, these, these working groups are cross-cutting though, so we're working with many, many partners, including UNICEF and Gavi. Um, but so she'll bring the first topic to us. And then our second topic today 
will be from Ilana Giga. She's a technical officer in the WHO Health Emergencies Program, and she's also working on the COVID-19 Allocation Mechanisms Group. So she'll talk to us about the, the process for countries to be allocated vaccines. So these two topics are very complementary. And without further ado, I would like to hand the, um, the, speak, the mic over to Diana Chung Blanc so she can walk us through the National Deployment and Vaccination Plan. Um, process. Greetings, everybody. My name is Diana Chang Block. I work for the Immunization Vaccines Biologicals Department in WHO. And um, we're facing really an unprecedented challenge right now um, regarding the um, rate of vaccine introductions for COVID 19. So here you see all the antigens that are used in the um, expanded program on immunization. The fastest rollout we've had globally is for the IPV introduction, which is the farthest um, black vertical line you see on the right around 2014. If you click again, please. You'll see, thank you so much, that in about four years, uh, we had a quite vertical um, trend going up in terms of introduction. Yeah. So you see for COVID-19 vaccine introduction, mm -hmm. the um, angle of that line is much, much steeper in terms of trying to get as many of the target populations immunized as quickly as possible. Next. And this is as, yeah, that's fine. Next slide. And this is the slide for where we stand today as of this morning from our world in data source, where we have 66 countries that have started COVID-19 vaccine introduction uh, with different types of vaccines. We currently have five right now on the market um, with 135 million doses administered. This is not 135 million persons. It's actually doses as some of the um, products, as you know, have a two dose schedule. Uh, but it gives you a sense of the breadth globally of where we are on vaccine introduction. And clearly the map indicates that the scale of introduction and the speed um, has neglected a large part of the globe. Uh, and it is mostly upper and upper middle income countries that have had access to the vaccines. And this is a situation that the COVAX facility is trying to rectify. Next. So the ACT Accelerator, um, the COVID, COVAX facility sits in the ACT Accelerator, Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, ACT-A. It's a global partnership uh, that is striving to end the acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in the outer circle, you see all the key agencies that are a key partner within the ACT-A. Um, with the intent to um, support governments and civil society and collaborate with industry on the areas of accelerating the research development and rollout of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Next. And in the vaccine uh, pillar, um, that is where the COVAX facility sits. And the COVAX facility's goal is to accelerate the development and manufacture of COVID-19 vaccines. It is co-led by Gavi, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CEPI, UNICEF, and WHO. It's the largest actively managed portfolio of vaccine candidates globally, um, with the objective is to facilitate the fair and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines for all 190 participants with an end goal to try to deliver 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines by the end of 2021 so that we can put closure to the acute phase of this pandemic, which has affected us all dramatically, both professionally and personally. Next. So I'm going to focus on something called the National Deployment and Vaccination Plan, for short, an NDVP. 
Some of you may know it, some of you may not. Uh, the NDVP is a one country plan and it's the main strategic framework for how a country defines its COVID-19 vaccine deployment and vaccination efforts. For those countries that form um, part of the advanced market commitment, the 92 countries uh, that are within um, uh, the COVAX facility, uh, it is a requirement to access vaccines and the plan should be accompanied by a budget uh, and any um, elements around uh, rollout, which I'll explain in a future slide. Next. WHO and UNICEF have, have developed guidance for the NDVPs uh, that was issued in November. Um, and the guidance is um, based on uh, the core principles and values framework that have been defined by WHO and endorsed by its strategic advisory group of experts. So it's based around the prioritization roadmap, as well as the fair allocation mechanism for COVID-19 vaccines as defined by the COVAX facility. Um, the blue uh, dot uh, under the SAGE paragraph defines where you can find those SAGE technical guidance documents. And the very uh, lowest blue line is the link to the guidance um, materials that you see pictured on the left. Next. In terms of the guidance document for the NDVP, it covers 12 chapters um, from the beginning of the process, which is the regulatory preparedness, all the way to the COVID-19 surveillance and the post evaluation after COVID-19 vaccine has been introduced. Um, and it, it covers all the implementation functions in between those two processes. So for instance, the identification of the target populations of highest priority for immunization and the delivery strategies to reach those individuals, the preparation of supply chain management and health care waste, the human resource issues, vaccine acceptance and demand, vaccine safety monitoring, especially for adverse events, injection safety, and the data monitoring systems that must be established to be able to inform um, evaluation um, post-introduction. Next. And I had mentioned in a previous slide, the NDVP should be costed. There are many different ways to cost the activities outlined in the plan, um, but I just wanted to introduce you to one tool that um, WHO has also developed. It's called the CIVIC tool, Vaccine Introduction and Deployment Costing. Um, the link at the bottom shows uh, where the latest version is available. It's an Excel-based costing tool, and it is um, structured, it facilitates the budgeting process in that it's aligned with the SAGE target populations, the WHO SAGE target populations, and it is um, a good accompaniment to the NDVP because it follows the same structure. Um, and I put at the bottom of the slide an email address for those who may be already using um, the CIVIC tool. There were some trainings last week um, of a support email should you need to troubleshoot um, any issues around using that tool. Next. And this slide uh, also just expands a bit uh, the range of resources that are available to health authorities and health workers. At the bottom uh, right, um, the orientation to the NDVP. These blue lines are actually hyperlinks. Uh, so if you click on the hyperlink, you will get to the orientation to the National Deployment and Vaccination Planning document, which is uh, targeted towards national and subnational focal points responsible for outlining the strategies. And at the top of the slide, uh, COVID-19 vaccination training for health workers has also been developed and sits on our open WHO platform. It consists of six modules and is um, a bit uh, more interactive perhaps than the other resource materials in that it is um, video lectures, quizzes, job aids, uh, and also both uh, 
links there will uh, lead you to downloadable presentations that you can use for your own country implementation. Next. And lastly, um, additional resources, uh, tools to address vaccine misinformation, very technical um, tools for supply and logistics around cold chain capacity and stock management recommendations, the COVID-19 vaccination training for health workers, which I referred to on the previous slide. There's also a detailed simulation exercise. There are some countries who have rolled out the vaccines who have found that simulation exercises have been helpful to try to envis envisage what the um, troubleshooting issues or bottlenecks could be to help refine the introduction process when it actually officially rolls out. The costing tool I have just spoken about in a previous slide. And then as well, we have materials on infection prevention for COVID-19 vaccination. So uh, simply to say there is a wide menu and swath of resource materials that have been made available. If you um, leave with nothing else, uh, because I've provided lots of different web links, if you just look at that red link here on this slide, um, that's the entry portal to all the different resource documents um, that I've referred to. Next. So moving into the process issue of how the NDVP um, moves through to um, signaling a country um, can um, get approved for allocation of COVID-19 vaccines. So um, on the far left is the step one, uh, where countries have confirmed that they want to actually be part of the COVAX facility. That was something that was already done in December um, with the 92 AMC countries. Um, and some finalized, I think, through early January. Um, so those countries that have signaled their intention to be part of the COVAX facility uh, are now uh, have been working since that time on their NDVPs and have submitted them to the partners platform. And I'll speak to that in another slide. Um, once that plan is submitted into the partners platform, um, then the country plans, step three, are reviewed by the regional review committees, which is a multi-partner committee um, with um, WHO or UNICEF as the secretariat. Step four, countries that meet the minimum criteria, uh, which I will outline in a future slide, um, are included in the next allocation round. And step five then is a verification mm -hmm. step prior to introduction um, where uh, the regulatory approval, import procedures, INL agreements, um, and in immunization and liability uh, would then uh, verify before the doses are finally shipped in step, step six. Mm -hmm. And at this point, all regions have regional review committees and are quite active as we speak today on reviewing the NDVPs. Next. What is the purpose of the NDVP regional review process that is um, being undertaken currently? It's to assess the country preparedness for vaccine introduction, but more importantly, to provide the recommendations for countries on how to strengthen their plans if necessary to optimize um, their rollout um, when the doses are actually um, shipped. Um, ultimately, the review will lead to a signal to the COVAX facility uh, for when the country should be allocated vaccines. Um, and in this review process, uh, the identification of any type technical or financial gaps would be highlighted to enable countries to be supported in pre-positioning themselves well for a successful introduction. Next. So as stated, country ministries of health uh, have currently um, already started uploading onto the partners platform that's at the bottom of the page. Um, as of yesterday um, night, I believe we had 39 countries that have uploaded their NDVPs into the portal. Um, these um, applications have been coming in since the end of January. 
Uh, and today is the last day uh, for countries to submit into the, por into the portal um, because an allocation round will be run uh, early next week. Next. What are the options for the review outcomes? So um, the regional review will look at the structure of the NDVP on the different functions that I addressed in an earlier slide around the training plans, the human resource plans, the cold chain plans, et cetera. And either the NDVP uh, is considered of high enough quality that the country is accepted to be uh, included into the upcoming uh, vaccine allocation round, or it can be accepted with minor revisions. So there might be some areas of functions that would need to be addressed or clarified. Um, and the RRC will work with the countries to get that information, as well as to provide technical assistance prior to introduction to make sure those improvements can actually be executed. Or if the NDVP is found to have substantive gaps, um, which make uh, it a concern that the doses received will not be used promptly and effectively, efficiently, uh, or responsibly, then the country will be requested um, to, to revisit those parts of the plan and see what kind of revisions can be made uh, to then uh, resubmit the plan to be included in a future allocation round. And in terms of the allocation round, the next speaker Yona Giga will speak to the vaccine allocation rounds and how those work. Next. The minimum criteria for vaccine allocation. Um, the NDVP is reviewed on all the different functions, but the absolute minimum criteria that must be clearly defined are the high priority target populations to be immunized and the rationale for those target populations being defined. Um, and because of the short supply situation, obviously countries have a sequence of target populations um, by which they would begin to roll out the vaccination, that there is adequate supply chain and logistics um, and distribution strategies in place uh, to receive and quickly deploy vaccines and then a robust vaccine safety surveillance systems to follow any adverse events or adverse um, signals following immunization. In addition to these three minimum requirements, the Regional Review Committee will note the country plans in terms of their status for um, emergency regulatory approval, and again, identify any needs of support to help facilitate that if there are perceived to be any bottlenecks to the regulatory process. Next. And after a country is notified of the vaccine allocation, meaning the number of doses for which they have been approved and the product um, that has been um, earmarked for them, uh, the countries then will have time to fine tune their plans and incorporate and adjust any um, preparatory issues that need to get adjusted based on the actual characteristics of the product that they have been assigned. They'll have time to strengthen the areas that have been noted for improvement by the RRC. And prior to the actual physical shipment, the following will have to be verified. That's the documentation of the regulatory approval, the in-country licensing and import procedures, the signed indemnification and liability agreements, which is a requirement of um, within the COVAX facility by the manufacturers, and then confirm confirmation of any additional refinements that have had to be made to the NDVP due to the vaccine product specifications. Next. So the next section, <clears throat> that, excuse me, <clears throat> the next session for um, an orientation on the indemnification and liability for COVID-19 vaccines, which is quite a complex topic, so cannot be covered uh, today um, due to time constraints, will be Tuesday, 23rd of February, and the registration link will be shared shortly. Next. And I pass on to Joanna. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Thanks, Diana. And hello, everyone. <coughs> so I um, see the results of the last. Sorry, Shoshana, um, you wanted to make an announcement? Yes, so we will launch the poll results so that participants can see their poll results. And then, Iwana, we will turn to your presentation. Thank you so much. Iwana, over to you. Thank you so much, Shoshana. Um, and thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to um, present this uh, piece of work that we have been doing on the allocation mechanisms for vaccines. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, this is an overview of the presentation. So what I hope um, I, I will be able to convey is give you an overview of the mechanism itself, then go a bit more deeper into the allocation uh, logic, and also give you a glimpse into the governance structures that we will be using to support the allocation process itself. So if we are going to start with the allocation mechanism, next slide, please. Um, I want to take you back a bit into how the uh, uh, thinking around the allocation evolved. So um, as uh, Diana mentioned, um, the whole thing started with the enactment of the Act A and uh, uh, the need to uh, develop and uh, secure products that will be offered to populations around the globe in an equitable uh, manner. So from the allocation perspective, this is a work stream that uh, is embedded into the Act A. Um, and um, what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, the allocation mechanism that is specific for vaccines. So why did we need an allocation mechanism for vaccines? Because we know that in the beginning, there will be a limited number of such products, and these are, will be supplied through the COVAX facility, which is a very um, specific purchasing uh, mechanism that um, the global community has created. Allocating these products will require a strategic allocation uh, approach across these facility participants, which, as Diana mentioned, uh, have reached 190, so it's, uh, it covers most of the countries uh, in the world. And it's important to remember that the framework is one of the key components from the overall approach that aims to deliver equitable access to COVAX uh, vaccines. To start our work, we had to ground, it in, to ground it into a goal. And the goal that we want to achieve is to protect public health by reducing COVID-19 mortality, which will also have an, the impact of minimizing societal and economic uh, impact that this uh, pandemic has uh, brought about. Moving to the next slide, I would like to give you an overview of the principles that underpin the allocation of framework. And there are eight principles that um, uh, are important uh, to guide this work. Um, I also want to say that in terms of developing this framework, it has been an iterative uh, process of having uh, a group of technical people coming together to put these uh, <laughs> together, but then these have been um, developed in further consultation with the member states. So if we uh, talk through the principles, the first one is solidarity. Um, we all recognize that in order to confront this uh, challenge, we need to join forces and for the global community to come together. Another one is accountability. Um, the allocation process needs to rely on clear roles and responsibilities so that we can ensure procedural justice. We want this process to be transparent and also responsive to public health needs. And as you saw, it's grounded into a public health goal. It needs to be equitable and fair. Um, uh, we, uh, the whole uh, mechanism of access also wants to um, leverage pricing and procurement strategies uh, that will improve affordability for health products. Um, it does imply a collaboration that brings together global and natural stakeholders and it aims to really uh, build on best, best practices when it comes to regulatory and procurement uh, efficiency. Next slide, please. So moving into the mechanism itself for vaccines, it has been thought of in a phased approach because 
in the beginning, um, we sort of try to understand who is most exposed. And it was clear that everybody is exposed. So the threat is everywhere and no country is really immune to it. And we were also faced with a, a request from member states to offer predictability, um, because as you saw, um, the actual deployment of vaccines takes time and um, you need to have some sort of understanding of how much uh, doses might be allocated and accessible in a given time frame. So this led up to the articulation of this two-phase approach. The first phase is a proportional allocation up to 20% of the population. So in this first phase, countries receive doses proportionally to the total population in a progressive manner. Um, the pace that this, uh, these thresholds are being achieved will depend on the country readiness, so um, what Diana uh, mentioned in her presentation, and also supply availability. Once the 20% threshold uh, has been achieved, then a new phase will kick in. Some countries may uh, start ahead uh, if there is a consistent lack of meeting the readiness um, um, uh, criteria by other countries, but all efforts will be made that all countries move at the same time. Moving into phase two, um, a proposed weighted allocation is uh, uh, described. And why I mentioned it's proposed, because you will see when you access the publicly available document on the allocation framework, some um, indicators and metrics on, uh, that will guide the weighting are articulated. But the agreement was that once we are close to reaching phase two, these will be revisited so that they do uh, accurately match uh, where we are in terms of uh, global situation. So, but it's in its essence, what this phase two uh, approach um, means is that we will be looking at some indicators uh, around threat and vulnerability, and we may adjust the quantities um, based on these. But the principle is that every country is allocated something within the same round remains. It's just a question of whether uh, we would be moving away from a fixed percentage to a more, a more varied uh, uh, amount based on the metrics that pertain to threats and vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. It's also important to understand when uh, reading um, and looking at the numbers that are being allocated, that these are very linked to the access mechanism that um, uh, the allocation framework uh, serves. So um, some countries have entered into agreements that have specific uh, provisions that the allocation needs to be mindful of. Um, there are practically two main types of grouping of countries that have joined the facility. One is called AMC groups, that stands for Advanced Market Commitment uh, Countries. And then there are the self-financing participants, and that's why uh, you will see the acronym SFP. The AMC countries, the 92 countries that Diana mentioned, um, will be supported through uh, AMC donor funding and um, will procure through UNICEF Supply Division or BAHO Revolving Fund. When it comes to the self-financing participants, there are different models of participating depending on um, the type of uh, agreements they enter to. Some of them have exercised uh, uh, a right to be to opt out of certain vaccines. So um, they can opt out based on price like the committed SFP price opt-outs. And some of them can opt out um, depending on other things as well. And they will have two windows to exercise these opt-outs. These are the optional country uh, uh, agreements. And I'm mentioning them because um, they do uh, impact a bit uh, for example, how countries also, uh, how, how much of their population countries chose to um, cover. Not all countries chose to cover 20% of their population, some have less. So that has impact on the supply. Next slide, please. On this slide, um, 
I want to give you an overview of what are the other steps that impact allocation. So in order for the product to come into the allocation, they need to receive some sort of global regulatory approval. This is a signal that tells us that these products are ready to be used in a country setting. And from a WHO perspective, the WHO EUL or PQ are very important uh, uh, approvals um, that we, we consider. There are the country preparations and this is what Diana spoke to. Um, there is the readiness check with the NDVPs and all the forms that country needs to um, assign in order to join the facility. So these need to be in place. There is the procurement element that uh, is taken care of by uh, UNICEF Supply Division and PAHO Revolving Fund. And this is uh, really the contracts that um, are being uh, done with the manufacturers to understand the supply availability. So all these need to uh, feed into the allocation because these are important sources of data. After the allocation is run and a country will understand what sort of product they have been allocated, so the exact product that they will receive, they can proceed to obtaining um, national specific approvals that are needed to get the product into the country and to use it in their respective populations. And these are the national regulatory approvals, the import license, the indemnification agreements. And also this is the place post allocation where any outstanding readiness checks may take place. After these um, documents have been secured, uh, countries can place a purchase order with the procurement agencies and then shipment can happen. Next slide, please. So now I'll move into the allocation logic and I'll give you a glimpse of the allocation um, uh, algorithm that we are uh, going to use. Uh, in order to come up with the allocation um, algorithm, there are some objectives uh, that we set for phase one allocation. Um, and they are presented here. One is that no doses should remain idle. So we don't want to have doses sitting around somewhere in a warehouse while countries need them. Um, and that's why we use a lot of the supply uh, forecast data in order to allocate. Um, the allocation will serve all participants able and willing to receive doses. The products need to have that uh, regula global regulatory approval that uh, I mentioned previously. We want to minimize the time gap between the first and last participants, so not to have months and months passing before a country can receive something. Um, we want to stick to the proportionality principles that uh, countries receive the same proportion of populations. Um, we want as much as possible to minimize the um, co-circulation of different products within a country because this puts an extra stress on the pharmacovigilance uh, systems, so the safety monitoring. But of course, this is something that countries also um, uh, assess and decide. And then countries have also been asked to express their preferences in terms of products they want to receive. So we would strive as much as possible to meet these preferences. There are instances when this may not be possible. Of course, when you have one product to allocate um, it's very difficult to meet the uh, preferences. You have to allocate that product. Next slide, please. This is just to show you from the software perspective, um, these last uh, three principles, maintaining to a proportion of the population, limiting the number of products that circulate, and being mindful of the product preferences, they have been integrated into an optimization algorithm. So there is a software that will help us uh, to really try to maximize these principles so that we can ha have equality in population covered, we can ensure product consistency and match uh, participants preferences. And the highest weight is given to the equality in population covered. Next slide, please. This is another way of visualizing uh, the allocation uh, logic. Um, we, have, uh, we will be mindful of the supply 
um, forecast. So that's one piece of information. Then the demand considerations, and this is the data that comes from the countries. And then there is the optimization step that will match the supply and demand, uh, demand preferences and will generate uh, a proposed allocation list. Next slide, please. This is a more detailed view into the type of variables that that software will uh, uh, enclose. The software is being finalized as we speak. Um, but you, what is essential to see here is that a lot, in special, especially when we look at the supply and the demand constraints, they do also take into account the type of contracts that the countries have entered to when they join the facility. So that does have an impact on uh, the allocation. Next slide, please. What I would like to mention is also that when you read the allocation framework text, text um, that is available on the WHO website, you will see that there are some flexibilities uh, envisaged. And one that I would like to mention is um, for the small states. So this would be, uh, if you will be curious to look after we do the allocations of the amounts that have been allocated, you may notice that some countries may have received a bit more than others. And this would be due to this flexibility. The fact that there are uh, small island states that are hard to reach, so they may be allocated more than the percentage of the, uh, that was allocated to other countries in uh, that round. Next slide, please. And lastly, I will talk uh, very briefly about the governance uh, structures. Next slide. Thank you. Um, what's very um, important to uh, notice is that the allocation mechanism has two um, structures that are, and one is independent. Uh, it's called the independent allo uh, allocation of vaccine group. This is comprised of 12 independent experts that have been nominated by COVAX members and appointed by WHO. Um, and their role is to scrutinize the allocation proposals. So it will, this group will have the function of checking whether all the things that I presented before uh, have been done uh, correctly. Um, the IAVG will be supported by a secretariat sort of uh, structure. It's called the Joint Allocation Task Force, which is composed of staff from WHO and Gavi. And they will crunch all the data, run the algorithm, and go with this um, allocation proposal to the IAVG for validation. On the left side, you see some other structures that um, feed into the allocation mechanism, especially with data. So a lot of the uh, supply data will come from the um, uh, office of the COVAX facility. The WHO allocation unit also has a function of uh, maintaining the software. The procurement agency is also responsible for supply um, information. And uh, the self-procuring countries will also are a bit separate because they may not go through the procurement agency and they may implement directly the vaccine allocation decisions. And you can find more information on the independent allocation um, of vaccine group on the WHO website. You will see there who are these 12 uh, experts and read their uh, bio. I think this is the last um, slide. Yeah, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Iwana and Diana. I'll now talk briefly about what's next. And if you can also enlarge your comprehension. So the recordings from this session will be available in English, French, and Spanish. To continue the conversation, we have a TechNet 21 forum where you can continue to post questions. We'll also have the opportunity to answer some questions on today's call. But we want to make sure that you can keep um, having exchange with technical experts and getting the answers you need. Our next session, as Diana mentioned, for national and subnational stakeholders will focus on identification and liability. That will be next, uh, in two Tuesdays, the 23rd of February at noon. Next Tuesday, we will have our health worker webinar series begin at the same time at noon. So that's Tuesday, 16 February at noon CET. So the same time that the session today started. That first session will focus on interpersonal communications. 
and we have the registration link available for you. With that, I'd like to say thank you so much to everyone who has presented and please to all of our participants, feel free to write your questions about the national deployment and vaccination planning process, submission process, review process, or allocation process to our presenters. And I look to the questions that we have in our question and answer. It looks like many of those have already been answered, but there are several that may still be interesting for us to talk through on this call. I see one question is on cold storage and how that's being affected by COVID-19 vaccines. We will have a topic focused specifically on supply and logistics upcoming. And so we will share out uh, the link to that session shortly so that you can ask all of your supply and logistics questions to those technical experts. There's a question about vaccination rates globally and the clear strategy. So WHO has a strong call for action for health workers to be vaccinated and we can share out information about vaccination rates. Um, Diana did give a brief overview on that in her presentation. We can share the link to that. Um, I see there's also questions on vaccine effectiveness. This will again be its own session. You guys have fantastic questions that deserve really good time and attention. And so we will have um, technical experts come and talk to you about vaccine effectiveness in a future session as well. So please stay tuned. Please look to see um, the topics of future sessions that we'll be having, because I think we'll be answering a lot of your questions in detail on those future questions. Are there any other questions that have been flagged for us to answer live? I see there's a question about the 92 AMC Gavi question, uh, 90, 92 AMC Gavi countries. Again, we can share out the link to those 92 AMC Gavi countries in the chat. I see there's a question for Iwana. Uh, Iwana, can you talk more about the Joint Allocation Task Force and the Independent Allocation of Vaccines Group in the NDDP assessment? Please answer that question. I realized I was muted. Thank you so much, Shana. Um, yes, so um, if you remember that slide where I showed the processes that feed into the allocation, the allocation will receive data on the country readiness assessment. So by the time that data uh, reaches the allocation group and so first the JAT, which is the secretariat, and then the IVG, which is the validation body, they would have gone through the review process that Diana very nicely uh, described. So the information that reaches the allocation body is whether countries are ready, are getting ready, or are not ready. This assessment is based on the NDVP. Um, in the allocation, we will introduce the countries that are ready or getting uh, ready. And um, we do hope that the instances where countries are deemed not ready to be very few or uh, um, hopefully uh, not to exist. But we would be looking to the country readiness group and the structures that have been put in place to give us that signal of uh, the country readiness assessment. Thank you. Wonderful. I see there's a number of questions about what would disqualify a country from being allocated vaccine. Iwana and Diana, would you like to speak to that? So in order to run the allocation, we would need data and we would need that country to want to be allocated. <laughs> so um, from the allocation, it's more of a data driven consideration. If I may give you an example, if a country has opted out of receiving a specific vaccine. And because of the supply, we only have that, that vaccine to be allocated, then it's understandable that that country will not be allocated something in that round. Um, I, and I will leave uh, Diana to talk about the readiness uh, aspect, that's okay. 
Yeah, so just to clarify that no country would be disqualified from the COVAX facility. So the intent is to have every country that signed on the COVAX facility to access vaccines. Uh, the issue is more about the timing of when a country is actually ready. Uh, and the readiness is based on three minimum criteria. One is having a clearly defined strategy for the target population, whether it's health workers, essential workers, transportation workers, et cetera. Um, the second is the adequate vaccine and supply chain capacity to receive vaccines. The third is an adverse event vaccine safety surveillance system in place. Um, so some countries uh, will struggle with some of those aspects and WHO and UNICEF are there to help countries address those as quickly as possible. Um, so that they can uh, move forward through the allocation process that Ioana so um, um, clearly defined. Thanks. Wonderful. I see a couple of other questions for our panelists, including the deadline for submission to national climate and vaccination planning being today. Diana, can you please speak to that deadline and what that means? Yeah, so the deadline, first deadline for the first official allocation round is today. Um, and many countries are online for that. Um, and the deadlines are set bit, um, by the allocation group um, based on kind of the supply picture. So I'll let um, Joanna speak to when they expect the next allocation round um, so that that would help define when the next opportunity is for countries to submit their NDVPs. Um, just to point out that the platform is always open to receive um, deployment plans. So even if a country misses today's date, it remains open for them to upload as soon as their strategies are ready. Um, and then they'll just be included for review in the next allocation round. Thank you very much, Diana. On the allocation round uh, that may be coming up, we are still looking up what would be the best time frame um, to schedule them in. Um, our clear tri trigger to um, start an allocation round is when a product receives that global regulatory approval. So um, we all recognize that we are in an environment of where it's still characterized by a, lot, by a lot of uncertainty. So it's very difficult to say uh, a date, but that is something that is very important from the allocation standpoint. So when the global regulatory is uh, being granted. Wonderful, the next question we have is, how is the identification of variant strains impacting vaccine deployment planning? Diana, can you speak to that? Yes, so we just had a a meeting at the SAGE yesterday, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts in reviewing um, the data for uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine um, that is anticipated for EU licensing. Uh, right now, we've just had uh, two vaccines that have been EUL'd by um, WHO. It's the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, um, and the AstraZeneca is anticipated in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and the conclusion of those discussions, which will um, be uh, put into a public report as uh, the deliberations were for Moderna and Pfizer, is that at this point, there's, there's not enough evidence to say that the vaccines will not work against uh, the different variants. Um, so that vaccination should proceed and that um, evidence will continue to be generated uh, around um, the impact of these variants on the vaccines. And if I could just pivot, because I see a number of different questions around age groups, um, I would like to recommend, so in my slides that there was a link to the SAGE um, deliberations on the vaccines so far, I would encourage people um, to look at those links because it actually describes product by product. So every product is different. We kind of say COVID-19 vaccines in this very general term, um, but every product has very specific um, efficacy rates, very specific target populations, um, very specific cold chain and handling um, characteristics. Um, so it needs, the country needs to be ready for that particular product. Um, 
So most of the products now are um, recommended for uh, adult populations over the age of 16 or over the age of 18. Uh, they may or may not be recommended for pregnant women. Uh, some of them have cutoffs in terms of age cutoffs uh, for those perhaps over 85 and who are frail. Uh, and they have different cold chain requirements. So it is only the Pfizer vaccine that has an ultra cold chain requirement um, of negative 70 to negative 90 degrees. So it's only appropriate in certain countries that can actually handle such a vaccine and have a reliable supply of dry ice or have special equipment. Um, the upcoming allocation round, however, that Ioana has been speaking of is for the AstraZeneca vaccine, which we hope will be licensed shortly. And that vaccine is a two to eight degree vaccine. So it's a vaccine that is, um, that all immunization programs are quite fluent in handling and managing in terms of cold chain capacity, um, or at least temperature management. Uh, so it should not be a challenge in the vaccine management and storage um, aspects, uh, although the country still has to get ready in terms of its cold chain capacity. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much, Diana, for that really helpful response. I see that there's two clarification questions needed. One about what requirements are as a country required to meet before receiving the vaccine, and it would be helpful if we could just go through that one more time we're going to make sure all are on the same page. And the second question is, can you please outline uh, the next steps for countries following the national deployment and vaccination plan submission? So if we could just do a very brief one through. As a reminder, the recordings will be shared out after the call. Um, the slides will be as well. So we just do that last quick highlight. So I think I'll let Joanna take the first one because I think that's about the verification checks. But Shoshana, I apologize, you broke up a little bit. What was your second question? So for countries that are submitting, if there's anything else that they need to be aware of as they submit today. So a final piece of advice. Thanks, Anna. So um, if you remember from the slide uh, we had on the sequence, there, there is, of course, the readiness check, which is very important, which is based on the NDVP. And um, the majority of the assessment is done before the allocation. But for countries that are deemed as getting ready, there is a post allocation check to make sure that any last minute uh, recommendations uh, have been uh, fought through. In addition to that, there are some documents that are um, specifically needed to import and use the vaccine in country. So for a vaccine to be used, they need, it needs to be granted an approval from a national regulatory agency, the medicines agency in that uh, country. Some countries may, may recognize or rely on the approval that has been granted from other bodies, such as WHO pre-qualification pro, um, program. Uh, some have their own assessment, so it varies from country to country, but there needs to be um, an understanding that this has been thought through and there is the um, approval from the national authorities to use that medicine in that setting. Um, there is also the indemnification and liability considerations, which are product specific, and um, there will be a special session dedicated to this. And then this, all this information will need to go, and the import license, and all this information will need to go to the procurement agent, which will be UNICEF Supply Division or Bajo Revolving Fund, so that a purchase order can be placed, so that the manufacturer gets the signal, okay, we can ship the product to that uh, country. Thank you. Great, and then uh, Shoshana answered your second question. So there are just a number of really excellent questions in the chat. And unfortunately they cannot all be answered but they all will be answered in some way, shape or form. And I'll let Shoshana give you the feedback on that. I think the concluding remark uh, that I would make simply to say that uh, there is a lot of information, a lot of resources available to all of you. Uh, it may be very difficult uh, to navigate. Um, so please feel free to reach out um, to the COVID-19 um, site or on to the TechNet site. 
uh, to get um, the support that your country, your district, your province needs to help execute smoothly and just to um, hope you hear the resounding message that all partners that are part of the COVAX facility are here to provide any guidance and support and facilitation needed uh, to your country to have the most successful introduction and rollout and deployment as possible uh, because we are all in this uh, together and it's quite a milestone moment uh, for all of us. And uh, 2 billion doses in the next nine months is a huge challenge uh, and really uh, something that I think all of us are uh, awaiting with bated breath so we can find some level of normality again in our lives. So thank you so much and stay healthy and well. Wonderful, thank you so much to Bruce, to Ann, to Iwana, to Diana. Um, for all questions and to continue the conversation, please go to the TechNet forum. The link has been posted in the chat. There is also a Telegram group where you can ask your questions. And with that, we would like to say thank you so much to all participants and to our fantastic interpreters. Um, and have a wonderful rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Great, excellent session. See you soon. <laughs> Bye, Bruce. See you later.